So you probably saw this in DL already, but we have scalar quantities, which we've talked about exclusively so far in this quarter. Um, and they're quantities that have a magnitude but no direction, like mass, energy, temperature, right? Just three kilograms, four joules, two degrees Celsius, whatever. It doesn't make sense to assign a direction for those things. We just have an amount and a unit. Um, speed is an interesting one. Speed is just an amount that describes how fast something's moving, right? Three meters per second, 10 uh, kilometers per hour, whatever. Um, but it doesn't have a direction. Speed does, however, have an analog with a direction. So if I take a speed and tell you it is left or north or up, it is now a velocity. So velocity is a vector quantity. And vector quantities have not only a magnitude, an amount, but also a direction. Um, clearly, not every scalar has a vector analog, like speed has velocity or velocity has a speed. Um, there's no directional temperature or anything like that. So only some things have um, make sense in both contexts. But vectors that we use a lot, positions, right? If I tell you something is four meters away, I want to tell you in what direction. Same thing with um, force. If I push something, well, what direction did I push it? So on and so forth. So as we're going to see, there's a lot of ways to represent vectors. Um, their magnitude and direction, but as long as we have those two things, it's a vector. First way we're going to talk about representing them is graphically. Well, I guess even before that, just textually, when there's a little arrow above a variable, that means it's a vector. So here, F, normally used for forces, um, is a vector, uh, and I'm representing it graphically with this blue arrow. How does this show us a magnitude and direction? Well, magnitude is its length, longer vector, greater magnitude. Um, direction, where it's pointing <laughs> is, you know. So in this case, it's, I represented it by like labeling an angle, but an arrow has a length and a direction, and so it's a great tool um, to use to talk about vectors. So a couple examples here, I've just drawn two vectors up here, x1 and x2. I'll say they're position vectors, so they just describe a position with respect to the origin that I've labeled here, just where they begin. Um, x1 points north, x2 points east. Um, and we can also see that x2 has a greater magnitude or a greater length than x1. So just like you know, velocity has the magnitude and velocity of speed, we can think the length, the magnitude of a position vector is just a length. Right? You can't have a negative length, but I can have a negative position. I can be negative three meters away from something, which would just describe a direction, really. Um, okay, yeah, so two vectors here, they have magnitude and direction, great. Another quick example, two more vectors. These, I'm gonna say, are velocities. So what these arrows tell us are that both V1 and V2 are velocities to the right, um, and we can also see that V1 is longer than V2, which just tells us that the magnitude is greater, or V1 is faster, right? V1 has a greater speed, represents a greater speed, um, but they are in the same direction. All right, so that's kind of the limit for, or I mean, that's kind of all we need to know about graphically representing vectors. Um, but it, not just can we see individual vectors, graphical representations also give us a good way to combine them. So how do we add vectors graphically? I have two force vectors here, F1 and F2. How do I add them together? We say tip to tail, tip being where the point of the arrow and tail being the other end. Um, we just stack them together. And then the result, the sum of the two, what we're going to call f net, is just the new vector that goes from the start of the first one to the end of the last one. So to add f1 and f2, we just stack them tip to tail and then draw a new one from the overall start to the overall finish. And what this graphically means is just that f1 plus f2 is f net. And drawing them out gives us a helpful way to find out exactly what the sum is. This rule, just adding them tip to tail, applies to as many vectors as we have. Just like normal addition, if you want to add two numbers and then add a third, just put it on the end. Same thing with vectors. If I want to add F3 to that, just put F3 on the end. And now my F net is the new vector that goes from my overall start to my overall end. And it does not matter what order you put them. 
So if I had like 60 different vectors and I wanted to add them all together, there's thousands, probably millions of different orders, permutations of how I can put them together. But the net will be the same no matter what. My start and my end point, connect them with one vector, that will always be the same no matter what order I add them. Just like with normal addition, three plus four is the same as four plus three, does not matter, it commutes. Um, great, so that's how we add them. Do a little practice. I've shown you here F1 and F2. Which one of these vectors represents F net? What does F net look like? Give you 10, 15 more seconds with this. Looks like we are all in agreement here. Uh, F net is going to be C, and why is that? Well, if we add them tip to tail, we put F1 and F2 together, we get F net. We could also just think about it like, you could say it in words, if F1 points up and F2 points to the right, then F net is going to point up and to the right, which it does. And just to verify that the order does not matter, I've shown here F2 and then put F1 after it, but I could switch that up and put F1, put F2 after it, tip to tail. Order doesn't matter. The F net in both scenarios is the same. The order of addition doesn't matter. How do we subtract them? Well, I think the easiest thing to do is to just turn it into addition, because we already know how to do that, right? Three minus four is the same as three plus negative four. So F1 minus F2, is the same as F1 plus negative F2. And if we know what F2 is, negative F2 is just F2 flipped around. So the arrow pointing the other way. And then we just add them together. So we take F1, add it to negative F2, and then just like with addition, connect our start and end, and we get our difference vector, or our F net. But F1 minus F2 is this F difference here. Um, I think that's the easiest way to do graphically, do vector subtraction, is to just make it addition and make one of them negative. Um, order does matter here, right? It matters what am I subtracting off from what. Um, so you do need to be careful there. F2 minus F1 is something different. In fact, it's negative this. You can play around with that. Um, but addition and subtraction work very similarly as they do uh, with just numbers. All right, so that's how we represent vectors graphically, and it allows us to add and subtract them. Um, however, we're gonna, of course, go a little bit deeper than that and deal with vectors quantitatively and do problems with them, so we wanna be able to talk about them algebraically. So like I said, the thing that the arrow lets us do is represent the two important things about a vector, its two qualities, its magnitude and its direction. And so how do we talk about those quantitatively? Well, magnitude, we just give its well, magnitude, it's length, so for a force, it would be in newtons, so like F1, magnitude for newtons, that gives us its length, and direction, instead of drawing the arrow pointing in that direction, we could just describe an angle with respect to some axis. So F1 here, I could say 30 degrees north of east. And it's very important that I say 30 degrees with respect to something, I could say north of east, I could say above the positive x-axis, I could, you know, I could say 60 degrees east of north or whatever you want. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to describe it, but if I just said alone 30 degrees, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I need to say uh, what that's with respect to. And then just another example here, F2, um, it has a shorter magnitude, so it's 2.5 newtons, and also a different direction uh, that I've labeled here as north of west, right? I could also have said it's this angle, this angle that's greater than 90, maybe if I wanted to also describe it as north of east, something like that. Um, I could say clockwise and counterclockwise with respect to an axis. It doesn't matter. Just when you're describing a vector, ask yourself, is this specific? Like, is the, does this describe one unique vector or is it ambiguous? And if it's ambiguous, well, 
make it more specific. So this method is good for describing a vector quantitatively, right? If I just tell you four newtons, 30 degrees north of east, we can all easily visualize this vector right here. However, <laughs> this method of describing a magnitude and a direction separately do not make it, does not lend itself well um, to solving problems numerically. I don't have a clear way to add these two vectors, right? There's no, like, I don't know how to add something that's 30 degrees north of east to something that's 60 degrees north of west easily. So we're gonna need another way as well. So this is still a valid way to represent vectors, um, but it's not great for working through problems. To work through problems, um, we're going to want to talk about vectors in terms of their components, right? So before, I just had one axis drawn across so we could label the angle, but I can always just put in an x and a y axis, right? Normally and almost always we'll think about y being up and down, positive y being up, negative y being down, and x being left and right, right being positive, left being negative, but that's really just a choice that we're making. We're saying like here's two directions and I'm going to describe my vector in terms of its amount in either of those two directions, right? But at the end of the day, it really is our choice, right? I would say this is in the positive x direction and the positive y direction, but if I, was, if I wanted it another way, I could say this is negative x. That's fine, just whatever goes this way is going to be positive x. That's our choice. Um, it's just, it's called a, a convention that we pick. Um, but I usually pick right is positive x, up is positive y, and so does most of the science world. Okay, so how do we represent f in terms of x and y components? Well, how far does it extend in x, and how far does it extend in y? That alone is actually enough information to describe the vector as well as with the magnitude and its direction. So here the f, the x component, like I said, is just its length in the x direction. I can draw this line and this length here is its x component, and its y component is its length in the y direction. And then f1, this vector here, um, we often write it like this. It is f1x comma f1y in parentheses. Just like we would label a point on a graph or something like that, we can describe a vector by where its end point is, right, with respect to the origin. So this is a very useful way to represent vectors that does allow us to add and subtract them. So now we have two vectors, same ones, F1 and F2, um, and now I've labeled their components, the X components and the Y components. Now we can add them because the problem before was I don't know how to add something that's 30 degrees north of east and something that's 60 degrees north of west. But I do know how to add something that's in the positive x direction and something that's in the negative x direction, right? That, those are along, that's just addition, along a number line. Same thing, I know how to add y to y. They're in the same directions, right? So now I essentially have reduced this problem into two addition problems. My new, my f net vector, the sum of those is just, well, the x component is the sum of the x components and the y component is the sum of the y components. So just like I had F1 is F1X, F1Y, I have F net is F net X, F net Y, and those two components are, like I said, the sum of the X and the sum of the Y component. And those are completely independent, the X and the Y direction. So that's another really powerful aspect of this way of describing vectors, is that we can just solve a problem completely in the X direction, and that's one problem, do the same in the y direction, and then put them back together at the end. So it simplifies these 2D problems into essentially a series of one-dimensional problems along each individual axis. And we won't really do this much, maybe one or two problems in this class, but the same goes for extending into a third dimension, right? In that case, we just have an x direction, one problem, y direction, one problem, z direction, in and out, one problem and then put them back together. So that's, that's a very useful piece of this. Um, yeah, just another way, visually written out, we have F1, F2, 
add them together, uh, we just get F net is F1 plus F2, and that's true for the individual components. Now, just so we can see how this meshes with our graphical way of adding vectors, so I've shown here that F net, the two components are just F, the sum of the X components and the sum of the Y components. If I add F1 and F2 tip to tail, like we did before graphically, we get this F net. So the addition of the vectors shows us how that works out. And then the component pieces uh, also work out to, to show that F net is indeed the sum of its individual components, which are themselves the sum of the components from F1 and F2. So here's F1x, the length of F1 in the x direction. And then F2x is negative, right? It's this little amount here. So if I sum this F1x plus F2x, which is this negative amount, that's how I get F net x. And that indeed is the length of F net in the x direction. In the y direction, both F1 and F2 are pointing up. Right? If we just single out the y component of F1 and F2, they're both up. So I just get the F1x component, or sorry, the F1y component plus the F2y component, and I get the height of the y component of F net, which is just the sum of the two. Um, so these two methods really mean, like graphically, algebraically, um, component by component, we're all doing the same thing. Um, it just depends what information we have, what we're trying to convey, what we want to solve for. Okay, so let's do a little practice. Um, what are the components of F net given these two vectors here? What is the sum of F1 and F2? Give you five more seconds or so. All right, so to add these together, we just go component by component. So F net X, the sum of the X components, negative one plus three is two Newtons. So the X component is two Newtons. And for the Y, we have negative two plus zero. So we get negative two Newtons. So F net is two, negative two. Newtons, which is to the right, right, in our positive x direction, and down, in the negative y direction, which graphically it agrees. If we take these two vectors, add them tip to tail, again, the order doesn't matter, we get a net vector that's pointing down and to the right. Okay? So now we have two methods uh, of describing things that we've talked about algebraically. We have this component by component method, which is very powerful and lets us do problems mathematically. Um, and then we have the kind of qualitative way of saying, here's my magnitude, here's my direction. That makes it easy for our brains to just visualize what vector I'm talking about. So how do we go back and forth between them? So let's say I tell you I have a vector that's four newtons, 30 degrees north of east, or something like that. Um, so in other words, I give you the magnitude and the direction. How do I find its x and our y components? Right, and the answer is trigonometry. Um, so also just real quick to note, these F, the X and the Y components, so we can think of them as just, I guess, scalars, magnitudes, like how much do I cover in the X direction, how much do I cover in the Y, but we can also think of it as vectors being the sum of two vectors that are only in those respective directions. So here's my same original F vector, if I make fx its own vector that only has an x component, so this would be fx comma zero, and then fy its own vector, that would be zero comma fy, and add those together, well, graphically, you can see it works out to make f, but then also algebraically, fx zero plus zero fy is just fx fy, or our original vector. So anyway, how do we get from 
this magnitude and direction notation to uh, our components, well, trigonometry. I'm not gonna walk through all of it in detail right now, um, but sine, cosine, and tangent uh, are tools that allow, allow us to go from having certain pieces of a triangle and find the others, or more specifically a right triangle. We might have an angle and the side length and we wanna find the hypotenuse, something like that. Um, if you're not comfortable with this stuff, um, you'll get a lot of practice and then also just like with exponentials or something, uh, watching a short YouTube video is, is a great way to just refresh on, on trigonometry stuff. Um, but in this case here, if I tell you my magnitude is F, and this absolute value sign we use to say magnitude, so if you have a vector in the absolute value, that means magnitude, um, and theta, the angle with respect here, with respect to the positive x-axis, um, Fx is just the magnitude of F times cos theta, and that's because Fx here is the adjacent angle. So cosine refers to the, or sorry, adjacent side. Cosine gives us the side that's adjacent. And Fy, we use sine, magnitude of F times sine theta, because Fy is the side that is opposite the angle we're given. So again, if that's not clear to you, um, it'll come with practice and a little bit of review. Um, going the other way, if we have our components and we wanna find the angle and the magnitude, magnitude we just get from the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, or here I've written it, the magnitude of f is the square root of the sum of the squares of the, so of the components. Um, and then the angle, that one's a little more tricky. We have to use inverse tangent of the opposite over adjacent. Um, but we have to be careful. So I've written here fx equals f cos theta and fy is f sine theta, and then also theta equals tan inverse fx over fy. All those are correct for this setup, but what if I labeled theta as this angle? Now they switch. Now fx is, comes from sine theta because now sine, the opposite side, is fx and the adjacent side is Fy, so I would not just memorize X goes with cosine or Y goes with sine because it's not true. F, like sine, goes with the opposite side and cosine goes with the adjacent. It just depends on which angle you're given or that you wanna find. Um, so that's something that you need to practice and be careful with. And similarly, um, whether this is Fy over Fx or Fx over Xy depends on what angle we're given. All right, so let's do an example of this one. So we're given a vector a here, and there's actually a typo. This should be a is three negative four, right? Because if we're saying down is negative y, this should be three negative four. Um, but I'll, I mean, for argument's sake, we could also, or just as an example, we're free to decide that down is positive y and up is negative. We get that's, I mean, there's nothing unnatural about that, it's just, in that case, whatever like gravity would be acting in the positive y direction. And you know, just, it's just a convention that we would then have to use throughout the rest of our problem. And it's probably annoying. But let's just, let's just assume it's a typo and a is three, negative four, the components of it. So our magnitude, just using the Pythagorean theorem, three squared plus four squared is 25. Square root of that is five. So the magnitude, the length of a, this blue vector is five, and that, the magnitude, it doesn't matter what the directions were. So whether that's four or negative four or three or negative three, we're squaring them. So it doesn't matter. And that just means like, it doesn't matter what direction this arrow is pointing, its length is its length, right? So there's our magnitude. Now where the direction does come into play, uh, we, to find theta, I've written here a y over a x. So inverse tangent of four over three, and we get 53.1 degrees. But like I said, is 53.1 degrees enough? <laughs> like if I just told you, without looking at this, A is a vector that has length five, okay, great, and points 53.1 degrees. You can't do anything with that. That doesn't mean anything. I need to tell you 53.1 degrees from where? So the way I've written this, I've chosen to do AY over AX which means that opposite, so when you do inverse tangent, 
you do opposite over adjacent. So I've chosen a y to be my opposite and a x to be my adjacent. So that means I'm using this angle with respect to the positive x-axis. Because if this is theta, this angle with respect to the positive x-axis, then a y is my opposite and a x is my adjacent. So this 53.1 degrees is that angle there. And if I wanted to describe vector a then, I would say a has a magnitude in the absolute value of five and points 53.1 degrees below the x-axis. I could also say it points 53.1 degrees south of east. That's another way to say it. I could also <laughs> mix it up and say it points 36.9 degrees east of south. So I could, there's nothing wrong with using this angle with respect to the negative y-axis. Um, it's just a different number. We have to be careful about that. I could either solve for that like I did here by just doing 90 minus 53.1, right, which would give us this, or I could have done tangent of the uh, inverse tangent, sorry, of x over y. That would also work instead of y over x like I did before. So there's no one right way to do trig problems like this um, as long as you use one of the right ways to do it. Um, and the terminology used to describe it, whether it's east of south, to the right of the negative y-axis, or you could say like counterclockwise from the negative y-axis, whatever you want to say, it's all fine. Again, just is it enough to uniquely describe this vector, right? And if it is, then great. If it's not, you need more information. All right, so we've been, at first, any questions on like the vector algebra here? So now we're gonna actually talk about the physics we're gonna use to describe this. This was just the kind of mathematical tools. Questions? All right, so forces. I've, used, I've displayed a bunch of forces, or maybe they were just vectors named f, uh, but what is a force? Uh, it's a vector quantity, like we've seen, um, and it's like a push or a pull. You probably have a pretty intuitive understanding of what forces do. They cause stuff to move. Or more specifically, it changes an object's momentum. So we'll talk, we haven't defined momentum yet, but it changes an object's motion, right? So that's what forces do, um, and a f as a result, the motion of an object is determined by the net force on it. It's key that it's determined by the net force, not just any force, right? Because I'm standing here right now, I have no motion, I'm stationary, but there are forces acting on me, right? Gravity's pulling me down, the ground is pushing me up, but the net force is zero. So that's why my motion is not changing, because the net force is zero. You can have whatever force is acting you want on an object, and the only thing that's going to determine its motion as a result is what their net, what their combined force is. Um, when we're labeling forces or you know, writing them in a problem, um, it's important in many cases, I would just recommend always doing it, but forces are on something by something. They don't just come from nowhere, right? You have a force that's acting on something and something else has to cause that force. And this notation will become, you'll see um, later on why that's important just because there's a lot of things to keep track of, uh, but that's generally how we should label a force. So let's take a look at an example of a picture hanging on the wall. It is stationary, its motion is not changing, right? So what does that tell us? That its net force is zero, right? But there certainly are forces acting on them. We just know that they all have to add to zero. So let's check to see if that's true. So we have a painting here and it's hanging by this two strings that are pointing up and outward um, and we have gravity pulling down. So the forces I've labeled here we have F by string on picture, we have another F on string by picture from the other string, and then we have F by gravity on the picture. So here, everything is by something else on the picture, so we'll just label them F1, F2, and Fg. Um, a type of diagram that we're gonna use a lot is called a free body diagram, and that's just when we take all the forces acting on an object and draw them as just acting on a point. We don't care what the object looks like or what part of the object it's acting, whatever. All the forces are acting on an object, so it's much easier to just draw it all coming from one point. Makes it easier to visualize. Um, 
So still, we have two, two forces from strings and one object from, and sorry, one force from gravity. Um, do those add to zero? Well, yes, they do. If I take F1 and then I add it tip to tail with F2 and then add it tip to tail with FG, I get right back to where I started. So my F net is zero. Another way to see that, we can break it down into components. So F1 and Fy, or sorry, F1 and F2 both have X and Y components, right? The two strings pull up and out. Both of them pull up, but the sideways, the X components are in opposite directions, right? So they're both pulling in the positive Y direction, and then they're pulling in opposite directions in the X, in, yeah, in the X direction. Um, FG is just pointing straight down, so it only has a Y component. Right, there's FG is equal to FGY. There's no X component of gravity. So if I want to add them together, I just need to do it component by component or direction by direction. So separately, the X components, F1X points left, F2X points right, and they cancel each other out. So added together, we get F net X is zero, perfect. And in the Y direction, both F1Y and F2Y are positive. Right, both of the strings have an upward component of their force, but they're canceled out by gravity. So what we've illustrated here is that the forces on the painting, um, the string is there to hold it up, right? That's the whole point. This Y component of their, the forces from the string are why we hung the painting up um, to keep, to balance out gravity. But then these X components that we introduce have to cancel so it doesn't move to the left or to the right, right? If one force was stronger than the other in the x direction, then it would move left or right, which we don't want. Um, so one more way to do this, uh, actually algebraically out, f net x is f1x plus f2x, and if that equals zero, then it tells us that f1x equals negative f2x, which is what we just said, just kind of intuitively, or just logically working this out, that the X components of the forces from the string are equal and opposite. In the Y direction, we have all three Y components sum together uh, to zero, because again, we want F net X, or F net X and Y to equal zero. So that tells us that F1Y plus F2Y, the total force upward from the two strings, is equal uh, and opposite to the force of gravity, which is downward. So the total Upward force cancels out the total downward force, total left force cancels out total right force, and we get F net X, or F net equals zero. Okay, so let's do a clicker question. We have a truck with a cabinet on it, and it is not moving. So there's no motion here, cabinet's just sitting on a truck. What is the direction of the force by the truck on the cabinet? a little hint here, since the cabinet is not moving, right, this is a stationary system, F net is zero. So the net force on this cabinet must be zero. So if F net is zero, what must the direction of the force by the truck on the cabinet be equal to? All right, so we are pretty split on this one, which is good. This is a tricky one. What direction is the force of gravity pulling? So I guess first we need to decide what are the forces acting on the cabinet. Clearly there's a force on the cabinet by the truck. And then, like I just said, the only other force acting on the cabinet is gravity. What direction does gravity pull it? Down, right, straight down. It doesn't matter what the surface is, whatever, gravity pulls straight down toward the ground. So if gravity's pulling straight down toward the ground and our net force is zero and our only other force comes from the truck, 
the truck must exert, exert a force that's straight up, right? It must cancel out gravity. So the, it's a little tricky, right? Because we look at this picture and we, we think like, oh, but if, you know, if it was going to slide, it would go like diagonal. Like you think that the truck bed is going to push perpendicularly to it. And there's good thinking there. And that's all true, that the force from the truck can be broken down into different components. So these two solid arrows, just the up and down, that's the most simple way to view this. That was the answer to the question, right? Gravity pulls down. And so if nothing's moving, the total force from the truck must just be up, equal and opposite to gravity. However, let's think about why the cabinet is not moving. So if the truck bed was made of some slippery material, oiled ice, whatever it is, the cabinet we know would slide down. Right? The reason it doesn't slide down is because of friction. Right? And friction acts along a surface. So that's not, I mean, we can take it for granted. We can also just think about like how friction works. If there's friction between my like hand and this table, sliding my hand across the table, friction doesn't push it away from the table or pull it toward it. It just resists the motion of my hand in the plane of that surface. So friction is resisting the motion of the cabinet that goes down the bed of the truck. And then there's normal force. That's what's acting perpendicular to the bed of the truck. Normal force is just the force, the name of the force we give to, that prevents things from like going through each other, right? Normal force is the force that's keeping me from going through the ground. Like the force of the ground on me is normal force. The force on my laptop by the table is a normal force. The force on the cabinet by the bed of the truck is the normal force. And that points perpendicularly to the surface, right? That force, the, the truck bed doesn't move the cabinet magically up or down it, right? It just keeps it from sinking below, like into it or away from it. Or sorry, not away from it. Just keeps it from sinking into it. However, if we combine this normal force with the friction force that we just found, then we get this net force that points straight up, this F surface, the answer to the question. So if you were thinking about the other answers to this question that could be, oh, is the force from the truck bed perpendicular to it or is it along it, something like that, there are components of the total force from the truck bed that are in those directions. Uh, but since we know that gravity points downward and the only other force comes from the truck bed, that the total force from the truck bed just must cancel out gravity. Um, and from that, we can actually figure out the length of these components too. Right? We know that the length of this F surface vector has to be exactly the same length as the gravity vector, because right? they have to cancel each other out. And then knowing that, I know my F normal is perpendicular to uh, the surface, and there's only one triangle uh, that we can make that has one component going out and one component going along the surface um, that will give you that length of F surface. So We'll, we'll work on that type of stuff, solving individual problems. Um, but you can actually determine all, like a lot more than you would think just from knowing that F net is zero in this case. Okay, so let's take a step back. We said force is what changes the motion of an object. How do we describe the motion of an object? And we do that with momentum. So momentum is another vector quantity that we're going to be working with a lot. Like I said, describes the motion of an object, has a magnitude and a direction. Um, the motion of an object is a little more than just its speed, right? It's its speed and its direction, which together make a velocity, right? But we need more than just the velocity of an object to describe its motion. If, I, if you're standing here and I toss you a golf ball with some velocity, and then I toss you a bowling ball with the same velocity, you're going to feel that there is a difference between the motion of those two objects, right? And the, when I say motion, what we're, at, we're feeling is a difference in the momentum of those objects. Why? Well, even though they had the same velocity, they have a very different mass, right? A bowling ball has a much larger mass than a golf ball, and so it carries a lot more momentum. And momentum, mathematically, is just the product of the mass and the velocity. So mass is a scalar, but velocity is a vector. Um, so I guess that's one little concept buried in here, is that we can multiply vectors by scalars. Or you know, we can just multiply vectors by a certain amount, 
and that just changes the length of a vector, right? So I have a velocity that's moving to the right, and I want to find the momentum of that object. I just multiply it by the mass. The momentum is still in that right direction. It's just rescaled by the mass. So for momentum, we have, like I said, we have two objects moving with the same velocity. If one has a larger mass, it will have a larger momentum. Similarly, if we have two objects with the same mass, but one's moving faster than the other, that one that's moving faster will have a larger momentum. So momentum describes the motion. And we said changes in momentum, so delta p, not just p, not just the momentum, but a change in momentum is caused by a force. And not just a force, but a force applied over time. Right, so here's a chair. And it's stationary. This chair has no momentum. If I want to give it momentum, add some delta p, so then it has some p final, some resulting momentum, I need to apply a force, but not just apply a force, I need to apply a force for a certain amount of time. Right, so you can see here delta p is f net times delta p times some change in time, some time interval. If I apply the same force, except one, I apply it for a half a second, and the other I apply it for two seconds, you'll see that when I apply the force for two seconds, I'm going to impart a lot more momentum to the object, even though I applied the same force. So watch, if I push this chair, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but if I push this chair just very briefly with some force, I give it some momentum. But if I apply that same force over the course of two seconds, then the chair gets a lot more momentum, right? So it's not, so we could increase either. If I either push the chair harder, increase F net, or increase delta t, increase the amount of time uh, over which I apply the force, then I'll give more and more momentum to this chair, more and more delta p. You'll also see this impulse j net, which is also a vector. j net, like impulse is just a change in momentum. So it's, it's not like a new thing. It has the same units as momentum. Um, you get it from f delta t. It's just a way of talking about things. So if, like, if I apply a force over a time, that's me delivering an impulse. And delivering an impulse to something changes its momentum. So just kind of a vocab word to know, but the meat of the understanding is F net del delta T causes a change in momentum delta P. Okay. So some more about momentum. An object can still be moving even if F net is zero. So we said that the F net, the net force on an object applied over a time, gives it a change in momentum. And F net is, so F net determines the change in motion of an object. But an object can have some momentum, and we don't need any force to keep it the same, right? So this, I could just be floating in space with some velocity, and I don't, there's no force acting on me that I need to do that, right? Because my momentum is constant. Force causes a change in momentum. So you can have F net on something that's still moving, right, as long as that motion is constant. If it speeds up or slows down or turns or we change the velocity or change the momentum in any way, then you need a force to do that. Um, stationary systems are the easiest, right, that if momentum is zero, then F net has to be zero. But momentum doesn't have to be zero for F net to be zero. Um, and then the other thing we'll, that we'll talk about with collisions and cis, yeah, question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, that's exactly it, yeah. If you're, you're stopped on your bike, your momentum is zero. You need to pedal, apply some force to increase your momentum, and then, so you achieve it. You have some new momentum, P1, whatever, and then you stop pedaling. The net force has now gone to zero, or maybe there's wind resistance and stuff, but ignoring that, the net force is now zero. You're not applying any force, but your momentum stays that P1 that you got to. And then you have to apply a new force either pedal more or break or do something to change from that momentum. Um, good point. Um, right, so systems with more than one object, um, just like in 7a, um, we have open systems, closed systems, and we can decide what's in our system by just drawing some boundaries and saying anything that's within these boundaries is in our system, anything that's not is not. Um, so we can define the total momentum for a system, and that's just the sum of all the momentum 
momenta uh, of all the objects in it. And they're all vectors, but we know how to add vectors, right? So we just add them either graphically or algebraically, and we can get the total momentum for the system. And if the system is closed, or in other words, there is no net force acting on it, the only things that we're looking at are right in front of us in our system, then our p total has to be constant. In other words, our delta p total is zero. So no net force on a system means the total momenta of all the objects has to be constant. They can exchange momenta, ex like one can give some momentum to the other, one can give that back or to another one, it doesn't matter, but the total has to be constant because it's not, nothing is adding or subtracting from our total. We can also have an open system where there is a net force. And in that case, the total momentum of all the objects can change. Um, so again, we just have to be careful. Is there net force? And then stick with the rules here. Um, and specific, yeah, if there is a net force, then we know exactly what our delta P total is from this equation that we found before. F net delta T um, a fo net force applied over some amount of time gives us a change in momentum. All right, so let's do a simple example here. Um, so ignore the chart at the bottom for now. We're gonna talk about this in one sec, but let's just go over what's going on. We're given an initial and a final state, and there's a collision, right? So we have one ball, a smaller ball, that's moving toward a larger ball that's stopped, right? And then they collide, and afterwards, the smaller ball is stopped, and the larger ball is now moving away to the right. So we just have a collision, one thing hits another, and the other takes off in the other direction. And we're gonna use this chart here to kind of tell the story and fill in the blanks of what's going on during this collision. So momentum charts are a really useful tool that we're going to be using for the rest of the quarter pretty much, and we're gonna expand on them and change them a little bit. But at the end of the day, it's just a way of like organizing equations or kind of doing them graphically. Um, and then, yeah, so we're never, I'm not, I don't plan on asking you on a quiz or exam to ever like make a momentum chart, but it's generally always a great way to start um, a problem, just because it organizes everything very concisely and tells you exactly what do I have and what do I need. Um, so, the way momentum charts work, we have a row for each object in the system and then a total, so ball one has a row, ball two has a row, and then we have a total, and then as we go across the columns, we have our P initial, our delta P, and our P final. So this is just a way each row tells us P, like the momentum for each object. It's an, like it's a little equation, right? They add across P initial plus delta P gives us P final, right? Initial plus a change gives us our result. And we have the individual rows for that. And then the total, we just add down the column. So if I want my total initial momentum, I just give initial momentum for ball one plus initial momentum for ball two gives us my total initial. Same thing, delta P1 plus delta P2 gives me delta P total, so on and so forth. So this momentum chart, you can use it, I mean, it basically is a bunch of equations, right? Each row is an equation, P initial plus delta P is P final, and each column is an equation that just summing up each individual part gives us a total at any given point in time. So this is already filled out, but we'll, we'll walk through how we would fill it out given the information that we have. We're given here the before and the after. So we're given, in other words, the initial and the final columns. And it would be our job maybe to find out the delta P, like what happens during this collision. So let's start with our initial. We know that ball one is moving to the right with some velocity and ball two is stationary. So that tells us that my initial momentum for ball one is some momentum arrow to the right, and my initial momentum for ball two is zero, because it has zero velocity. And so the total momentum for my starting state is just whatever that momentum of ball one is, m1 times v, whatever its velocity was. Um, and the, the length of these arrows is just determined by whatever the magnitude of the, uh, the momentum is, so how big m1 is, how big v is. Um, when you're drawing these, well, yeah, it's kind of hard to see in this problem, but the length of the arrows 
you can just kind of generally scale. You don't need to take a ruler out and make your momentum charts, um, but just generally if one has a bigger mass and one has, and they have the same velocity, then that momentum arrow should be a little bit bigger. Um, we'll see examples of that. Anyway, so starting point, ball one has some momentum, ball two has zero, so total is whatever ball one was. So that's our first equation here. We're also given the after scenario. After they collide, ball one stops, and so its final momentum is zero. Ball two is now moving to the right, so it has some final momentum as well. Uh, and so the total final momentum is just whatever ball two's momentum is, right? So initial state, ball one is moving, that's it. So the total momentum was ball one. Final state, ball two is moving, so total momentum is just ball two. Now we can kind of fill in the blanks. We need to get in this first row from ball one having some initial momentum to zero. So what change is gonna bring us from its initial momentum to zero? Well, just negative that, right? Ball one had some momentum, so its delta P has to just be whatever the opposite of that is, so that these two add together to get zero. P initial plus delta P, or negative P initial, gives us zero. Then for ball two, we started at zero, and then got to some final momentum, and so our change is just whatever that final momentum was, right? Zero to, to whatever that was. Now we filled out those rows. So now the fun thing, that's one way to think about that, is that we can now kind of make a relationship between the length of these arrows. So we know, I mean, think about it just conceptually for a second. Is this an open or a closed system? Are there any external forces acting on these here? No, on a quiz I would try to be maybe more careful about saying like there are no external forces or something, but this is just two balls colliding. The momentum between them, or yeah, the total momentum has to stay constant because nothing is adding or taking away momentum from this system. So if ball one has all the momentum to begin with and ball two has all the momentum to end with, then they must be the same, right? The initial momentum of ball one must be the same as the final momentum of ball two, because ball one just gave all that momentum to ball two, right? It can't go anywhere, and ball one got rid of all its momentum. So the change has to be, so these two, P initial for ball one and P final for ball two, have to be the same. What does that tell us about the speed or the velocity of ball one and ball two? Because I said they have the same momentum, the before momentum of ball one and the after momentum P final for ball two are the same. If ball two has a larger mass, what does that tell us about its velocity, its speed? Smaller, right? And I mean, that's also intuitive. If we have two things, if you have two things colliding, a small thing hitting a large thing, the, the, the speed that the large thing has as a result of being hit is, not, is going to be smaller than what we started with. If you have a car sitting on the ground in neutral and you throw a baseball at it, the car is not going to then speed off at whatever speed the baseball hit it because the car is a lot heavier and so that impulse, that momentum that the baseball gave to the car is only gonna give it a tiny little bit of velocity. Right? And we can, we'll, you'll work with some equations um, to prove that but this is just kind of a conceptual overview. Um, so tell, like going back to the chart, the story that we've told here, like I said, we have this exchange of momentum. And so this middle column, what we find is that delta P for P1 and de delta P1 and delta P2 have to be equal and opposite, or they have to add to zero. They're, it's just an exchange. Our delta P total is zero. It's not coming from anywhere, it's not going anywhere. So if our delta P total is zero, then all the individual delta P's have to come to zero. They're zero sum. Um, and so this is just a system of objects exchanging momentum. And our final momentum then has to equal our, sorry, our initial momentum total has to equal our final total momentum as well, if there's no change. So that tells us mathematically that the magnitude here, M2 VF, as I've written up here, has to be equal to M1 
v, right? Or in other words, what we just said, the total initial momentum is the same as the total final momentum. Um, so these momentum charts used graphically with just these arrows can help us get a conceptual idea of what's going on, but also they are, they like, they are equations, right? And you can even add, like we did here, the expressions for what these are. What is p final? Well, it's m2 times v final, right? And if you add these expressions, it just does read like equations. m1v plus zero equals m1v. Sure, that, that one's great. But also, zero plus m2v equals m1v. That's a useful equation that these two things are equal, right? Now I could, if I had some quantities, I could solve for other ones. So momentum charts, it's kind of a thing that you get a feel for. You'll, you'll see some patterns and stuff, but in general, you'll get some information about a collision, whether that's the before and the after, or maybe you know about the before and what happens during the collision, and I could ask you what happens after, or I could tell you, you know, here's the collision, here's what happens after, what was the initial state, whatever. But I'll give you some limited information, and then using a chart like this, you'll be able to fill in the blanks based on what you know about momentum conservation, that momentum can't be created or destroyed, that it comes from whatever the F net is, is what our delta V total is, um, and just from adding and subtracting along the rows and columns. Um, okay, so yeah, you're gonna see <laughs> tons of these uh, and they'll be really useful. All right, so clicker question. This is the last one of the day. Uh, here we go, okay. So we have two carts moving toward each other, same mass, same speed, not the same velocity, right, because the, they're pointing in opposite directions, but the magnitude of their velocities is the same, and they're gonna collide. Which one of these scenarios that's after the collision is not possible? So we don't know exactly, it depends on a bunch of things, what actually happens but we can say for sure that one of these scenarios is not possible as a result. So I challenge you to try making a momentum chart for this. You should be able to do it maybe without a momentum chart. It's a lot of work, but it's really good practice to try to scribble one out. Maybe I'll do it on the board after. I'll give you 30 more seconds with this one. All right, we'll stop there. So what is my initial total momentum for this scenario? Because there's no external force, right? So my, whatever that total momentum is, is going to be constant throughout the whole collision. What's my total? Well, I have some momentum to the right, mv, from one of the carts, and then some momentum to the left, negative mv, from the other. So the total is zero, right? We just have two equal and opposite momenta and they're gonna collide. So if we know that my starting point, my total momentum is zero, and that that total does not change, then the only possible final states are ones in which the total momentum is still zero. So let's go ahead and check. A, we have them going opposite directions, but the uh, speeds are still the same, right? So opposite velocities, same mass, so that one's good, right? The total here is zero. We have one half mv left, one half mv right, great. B, that's not the case. Now we have some total momentum, right? This says that both of them are going to the left, so we have mv over, like negative mv over two, plus negative mv over two, or we could also say now they're one object with mass two m times negative v over two, whatever we wanna say, but 
regardless of the math, now we just have two objects moving together to the left. So clearly there's some net total momentum. So that's not possible. So there's our answer. B is not possible. But let's check C and D just to make sure. C, very similar to A, we have them both moving in opposite directions with the same speed. So that's good. Total is zero. And D, everything has stopped. So total is zero there as well. So A, C, and D are all possible, but B is not. The reason being, F net is zero, so delta P total is zero. And so we need to find the one in which P final is not zero. Um, an interesting thing that we'll talk about this next time, um, but there still is a difference between A, C, and D. Right? We said they're all possible from a momentum conservation perspective. Um, but something that we might notice, kinetic energy. Right? That's what we're going to talk about down, down the line. One half mv squared is not the same for each of these. Right? In C, we have the same kinetic energy that we had to start with. We have two carts. For kinetic energy, direction doesn't matter because it's v squared. But we have two carts of mass m moving with speed v. Same thing with D. The directions are different, but two carts with mass m moving with speed v. Clearly, D has a different kinetic energy. It's zero. There's no motion here, so my kinetic energy went away. So there was not conservation of kinetic energy here. That's fine. Maybe it got lost to heat. Maybe the carts crumpled, something like that. And A is somewhere in between. In A, we lost some energy. Some kinetic energy went away, but it had to transfer into something else. So that's just a look forward. Momentum is always, always conserved. Right? Well, in accordance with F net, right? if there's some F net, the momentum change is exactly equal to F net delta P. But um, energy here, kinetic energy, is not always conserved. It can be transferred into other types of energy, like we've seen before. Um, OK, so you're going to get a lot of practice with this stuff in DL over the next week. And then we'll do some more complicated examples and dig into momentum charts and making equations uh, next week. Your quiz will be, again, on vectors in two dimensions and stuff. So you should be comfortable with trig and going back and forth between components, magnitudes, and direction. Um, but any collision, force, momentum stuff where you actually have to do math like this with momentum transfer and stuff will only be in one dimension on your quiz.